Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jonathan Zittrin, and I'm uh, one of the people behind a new Institute for Rebooting Social Media hosted at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Um, I can talk a little bit about the theory of that uh, center, which is uh, we are at a odd moment as collective guinea pigs in a uh, experiment that's been going on for about 15 to 20 years now without a whole lot of institutional review board clearance uh, in which we see if we completely rearrange the ways in which we meet up with one another, interact with each other, get exposed to uh, links and news about one another and the world and uh, experiment with who assigns what to whose news feed. Interesting things will happen. Um, uh, really positive things can happen and really awful things can happen. And in an era in which we're not entirely sure uh, what we would want to happen if we were to decide it collectively, whatever that means, and where we don't trust any institution to implement whatever we would agree upon, we have a lot of dilemmas about um, what uh, to think about this space. And certainly uh, the notion of rebooting it is a way of saying, uh, we should both be taking up issues around incremental and productive changes that intercede in current problems and uh, allow ourselves kind of the chance to brainstorm around big changes and uh, the true rebooting um, kind of sensibility. And uh, our new institute uh, hopes to be joining what is already a really rigorous and varied from many quarters effort to join in thinking about this. Um, it's both exhilarating and terrifying that nobody is in charge here. Um, and those who might be the closest to being in charge, nobody thinks should be in charge. And we're the last people to think we should be in charge, but um, we don't want that to translate into an abdication of responsibility or thought either. And um, we hope if you're out there listening to this right now, either live or later, uh, finding a link to it on social media if it has not been shadow banned. Um, I'm just kidding, I think. Um, we hope that you'll uh, join us and we'll be offering over the weeks and months different ways to join the activities of the Institute or offer up what you're doing and have a chance for us to help amplify that and vice versa. And uh, in particular, we have a call for visiting scholars uh, right now that's up on the website. I'm hoping that someone from our team can pop the link to it into the chat room. Um, and if not, I'll um, find a moment to do that. But we really hope that uh, you'll join us because this is the kind of thing for which it touches nearly everybody, even those who uh, are abstaining from social media use and uh, for which uh, public participation seems particularly vital. And I'm uh, really glad now with the help of Hilary Ross, Will Marks, and Madeline Matsui um, to welcome uh, my colleagues that you see also arrayed in the Zoom screen who each in their own ways bring an incredible wealth of expertise and deep thought and pressing questions around these things and maybe have no shortage of ideas uh, around these topics as well. And we thought we would focus uh, today's conversation on the private collections of data in the first instance available only to the likes of say, uh, especially in the US context, Facebook and Twitter. And uh, what, how to think about the use of that data to understand the platforms themselves and maybe something more beyond it. Because if we're to actually assess what's a problem and what isn't, what is just mere anecdote versus what is really a systemic issue, having information, having data and having people independent from those who have a great stake in what the data might show uh, seems quite relevant. So uh, again, we have a wonderful uh, group of people to have that conversation. I'd just like to introduce each of them, give them a chance to um, set a small fire, metaphorically speaking, and then uh, open it up to a fuller conversation. And uh, going alphabetically, weirdly enough, our uh, lead person it begins with P, Nate Persley, uh, a longtime uh, colleague uh, who has 
a wealth of data behind him in his work thinking through uh, elections in the United States. Nate, um, uh, you're the James B. McClatchy Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. So great to have you here. Tell us a little bit more that you think might be relevant about your background and anything around what's keeping you up at night, what you wish would happen, legislation that you might or might not have drafted and whether you think it should pass, anything you'd like to share, we're all ears. Uh, yes, legislation I might or might not have drafted. Let's, uh, you know, the answer may surprise you. Um, I look forward to the time, by the way, Jonathan, when um, you go alphabetically and Zitrain is the first one. That would be an interesting. <laughs> well, interesting I've got Ethan uh, even lower on the list than I am. After. That's right. That's right. So um, uh, let me cut to the chase here a little bit, which is that I have for the last five years been working with the platforms, particularly Facebook, trying to develop a system for outside researcher access. I both learned a lot uh, and lost much hair in the process. And it has been um, extremely frustrating and difficult. Um, not because, I mean, some of it is because of the, the, you know, to use a tech term, the general mishigas that afflicts these platforms, but the, also just the, the legal environment in which we're operating uh, and other uh, obstacles that we confronted in, in trying to build Social Science One. Let me, which was the, the, the uh, effort to try to get platforms to share their data. Let me just start with the, the, the 10,000 foot view, which is that the current uh, uh, status quo, where the platforms are the only ones who can analyze their data, and we have to wait for whistleblowers like Francis Haugen to blow their whistles is unsustainable. And so that we cannot live in a world where the only people who have the insights on what is most of human experience right now uh, are those who are tied to the profit maximizing mission of these firms. And so therefore I became convinced that government uh, regulation is really the only answer here. Uh, it is extremely difficult to craft a law like this, uh, particularly because you wanna make sure uh, to protect user privacy. And so privacy has to be first and foremost in our minds, but I wanna make clear that the question is not whether the data will be gathered or analyzed. The question is whether the only people who can analyze it are those who are tied to the firms themselves. And so the legislation that I put up that people can see my Twitter feed and elsewhere, and that now Senate staffs I'm hoping are, are adapting to their own um, uh, you know, preferences, uh, attempts to create a you know, federally mandated system administered by the FTC, which would compel platforms to share data on, under very secure privacy protecting circumstances with outside researchers that are vetted by a combined process of the, of the FTC and the National Science Foundation. There are a hundred different ways to skin the cat here, right? There are definitely, you could, there, and I don't have strong preferences except for the fact that these platforms should be subject to this kind of oversight and access that we need to find some way to break up their monopoly on the insights that can be derived from, from their data uh, and it's independent researchers, not those that are selected by the platforms themselves that need to be uh, the ones that have access. Um, but, but I'll just emphasize that there are, you know, it, as I said, it's not just that the details matter, they're the only thing that matters. It's extremely difficult uh, to, to craft this, which is why I've been waiting, you know, sort of working on this for seven months, but I look forward to uh, incorporating any suggestions people have. And, and more importantly, I put it up as a Microsoft Word document so people can use it as a template that they can edit and you know, call it their own and whatever not. I don't own this field. Uh, uh, there's a lot of us who are working in it, many of them on this call. Uh, so I look forward to hearing what others have to say. Um, and Nate, can you just explain why it's not like we feel the great press of need for car dealerships to tell us data about the customers and what they bought or grocery store customers or I don't know, clients of accountants, what makes this different that I hear the sense of urgency and passion for the federal government and the trade commission mandating a whole bunch of complicated things for data sharing? So I think there's several responses to that. The first is these companies are unprecedented in their power and scope. And so they pose unique dangers, both to the information ecosystem and democracy or at least they are alleged to pose those dangers. And um, we are in a position right now where policymakers are necessarily legislating in the dark because they don't really understand what the problems are because they have to trust 
the platforms uh, to express them to. But so that, that I think is one uh, critical, uh, critical fact. Um, I also think that, you know, whether we're talking about antitrust or we're talking about privacy legislation or content moderation and the like, um, that uh, we need, well, let me put it this way. If they are being watched by outside researchers, right? If there is some kind of transparency, it will change their behavior just by that fact, right? And so that I think it's quite important that we, we have a rigorous system of transparency. And frankly, there are other industries, you're right, it's not independent research, but we do require other kinds of disclosures uh, in other industries, but these are incredibly secretive, but powerful institutions that control you know, uh, a lot of the communication that's happening in the US and elsewhere. Got it. All right, thanks very much for uh, setting the table. And uh, this was BYOL, bring your own legislation. And I'm delighted you're willing to share it. So that like, you know, one, one dip once for, per person, we can uh, edit it and uh, do the wiki thing with it. Um, Nabiya uh, Syed, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I feel like you've had a kind of front row seat documenting for the rest of us not in the room what's been going on out there and occasionally are on the stage as well, uh, institutionally speaking. Um, tell us a bit about uh, both the markup and uh, the kinds of stories you've been pursuing and views you've been putting into the public sphere about this stuff. Totally, I would love to, and thank you so much for having me. I come from sort of a different tradition than the research tradition. I am the head of a nonprofit news organization called The Markup, where we do a lot of independent adversarial investigative reporting into different platforms. I also spent the last decade as a media lawyer, where I spent a lot of time doing transparency work, like First Amendment right of access work or FOIA work. And so I, I am very heartened by this moment and the framing of this panel, where we're not saying, what's the solution, right? We're trying to figure out what is the right system. This is a system of checks and balances for very powerful actors. And it's not the first time in the last hundred years that we've had to do that kind of thing. And I take a lot of solace in that, right? So, so continuing to set the table, right? Like in the 1930s, we saw that banks had a lot of power, maybe enough power to tank the entire economy. And then we saw the rise of the SEC and then generally accepted accounting principles. And I know uh, Ethan has a lot to say about um, inspiration that can be drawn from that. In the 1960s, we saw the rise of the administrative state and a variety of actors in the government with extraordinary power that were not elected officials and the desire to have the Freedom of Information Act as some way to like wrench information out of the open opaque uh, and at times necessarily secret um, goings on of the federal government, and then also decades of access litigation, right? First Amendment right of access work saying we get to have access to what happens in the courtroom, what happens in court records, which often contain trade secret, commercially in interesting information, as well as private information. And we have a system where we've seen that unfold. And that's the area in which I've litigated and reporters that I work with, reporters I've represented in the past do quite a lot of work too. Um, and then of course, now we're in this moment, we're like, hmm, big tech companies, you hold a lot of power over our economy in a variety of different ways. And now we're thinking about the system that we need in order to have checks and balances there. And so, you know, continuing from the sort of journalism media frame, I actually think it's a really interesting setup to be at the table with researchers in this moment, because I would say that this is a researchers and journalists have different time horizons, they have different incentives, and they have different tactics of what they're doing. And that's how I'll, I'll, I'll get to what the markup's been doing. In terms of time horizons, journalists are working on sort of a faster flywheel, right? We're taking in information and we're trying to report out in, if not immediately real time, close to real time, ways to make sense of what is happening in the world. So we had an investigation just last week about Amazon and Amazon's marketplace and you know the things that you see on the Amazon marketplace also at times many times being um, owned and sold by Amazon so Amazon gets to be both a seller and a holder of the marketplace what does that mean for the consumer right that's the type of research and journalism that we try to put out to the ecosystem in close to real time it's a different time horizon than than researchers get to enjoy right um the other is thinking about incentives, right? I think it was um, 
Brandy Nanaki from Berkeley, I think is the first time I heard someone use the science compliance frame, right? So thinking about journalists engaging a, in oversight as a form of compliance is our North Star. For researchers, it's the pursuit of science. What's super interesting about this moment is for all of the political will calling for accountability, they're not saying so for love of science. 2021 is not a good year for the love of science. Um, they're saying so because they want accountability and they want oversight, which is a slightly different frame that of course researchers can also claim and should claim, but I, I just wanna call out how that's like slightly different in terms of the traditional framing. And what that leads to is a difference in tactics, right? So for journalists, including ours at the markup, including others I've worked with, uh, being truly independent and seen by the public as truly independent is paramount. And so that means that saying, hey, come on in, Facebook's gonna have you know, some data that they vetted for you to look at, to play around in, is going to feel unpalatable. Um, that's not gonna seem like that necessarily always fits with the type of independence that many uh, journalists would want. And so what that leads us to is a desire for having independent, at times adversarial outside research. We're collecting data directly from platforms. We're collecting, and I, I would use the language of news gathering, what we can see and observe from the platforms. Got there it. are pros and cons there, right? Um, and so I think the proposals that to me are the most interesting are the ones that create safe harbors and space for that kind of adversarial collection to happen. There's a lot of complications and who's the right journalist, who has the right methods, who's actually faithful to um, the sort of privacy protective, public protecting logic. But that's, uh, I think that's the kind of fire I'm excited to, to start here and get into. Got it. It's really interesting to see people looking to other analogies and other situations to draw from, as you've kind of hinted at, and even just putting a stake in the ground around the Freedom of Information Act, where citizens and others, journalists, can, <laughs> 10 years later, get properly redacted, appealed, and then less redacted, unless they do the PDF redaction wrong, and then you just take off the layer. Um, documents from the government, the government is obliged to, once asked, uh, turn them over is, is very interesting. And also interesting when you think about, as you talk about checks and balances, uh, journalists doing so for researchers, those researchers of public universities might find themselves having FOIA obligations since they're state employees. And often that's been seen as a truly like quadruple edged sword um, uh, seen as potentially interfering with their work. So something interesting to be worked through there. But I even sense just to bookmark it, I, I'm curious how much you're already parting ways with Nate, because Nate's saying there should be a state created and enforced way to have regular proactive, don't even have to FOIA it, kind of data flows from the private parties. And I hear you talking about an adversarial system of the, the kinds of stuff you alluded to browser plugins with people willing to support the markup and then they share with you everything they're seeing from Facebook, kind of slurping data through the side door rather than having uh, a pallet of data dropped off by the grumpy trunk driver from Facebook who has to do it because the government said so. Are these complementary reproaches? If Nate's thing that works well, do we still need you with a grappling hook going over the wall? Yes, everything. Yes. Kitchen yeah. sink. Yeah, well, because you, those are that's a form of check and balance too, right? If the government gives you something, the agency says, here you go. And we say, well, wait a minute. We saw something different when we were observing it. What explains the difference? That's actually a helpful inquiry. That's its own form of check that happens on whether the agency is also remaining accountable. Because, you know, it, it's very funny to have come from a, a, a tradition of, of, of media lawyering where the government was the big baddie not giving up the information to move into this moment where we're like, oh, the tech companies are the big baddies, quote unquote, and the government's gonna give us information. It's a little bit of a whiplash, right? So recognizing that we need all actors, this is an ensemble cast, right? Like we need everyone to participate in order to have the kinds of checks and balances we need, um, which is why I will give the hungry, hungry hippo answer of all of the above. Like we need everyone involved in this. Got it. And I agree with that. And, and, and I'll say that in, in this legislation, there is a provision that provides for immunity for people who scrape publicly, uh, public data. So, but but uh, we can talk about this a little later. But um, if, if I could develop the, the 
research access for society bill instead of just research, you know, um, just for academic researchers, I would have written that, but, and so I look forward to others who can- And would uh, your bill, them. Nate, sorry to just, uh, yeah. just going after the rabbit as I see it, would your bill uh, be favorable to Clearview AI scraping everybody's photos so they can power universal facial recognition or Cambridge Analytica where people- No, think no, 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 that's what I'm saying. It's, it doesn't do it for private firms to do scraping. It, it still is, is nested in the academic framework. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying, no, if you could, you would. No, 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 no. I'm okay. saying if I could figure out a way to identify all the legitimate projects that should be allowed to scrape, then I would do so the way Got that- it. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about that more later. Very good. Thank you. All right, over to uh, Nicole Wong, former Deputy U.S. Chief Technology Officer, but you have been on both sides of the castle walls here, um, having been in the belly of the beast as legal director for products at Twitter, and then um, moving to a different chamber of the belly to really mix my metaphors here, uh, <laughs> Google's Vice President and Deputy General Counsel, known I think uh, it's a wonderful New York Times Magazine piece years ago that said you were the decider um, uh, trying to figure out the impossible balancing of censorship and law enforcement demands from governments interacting with the governments uh, through a semi-adversarial lens. Anyway, I should let you complete your bio, um, but so curious how you're thinking about all this having seen it from so many angles. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for inviting me. Like, this is the best dinner party I've been in. I don't know. <laughs> great. We'll take it. Pandemic yeah. notwithstanding. <laughs> I'm such a fangirl of everyone's work who's on this uh, group. So I, I appreciate all of it, particularly to Nate. Thank you for actually putting pen to paper to give us something to start to struggle with, because I think some of the questions raised by, by research um, access are, are really hard, right? The, the balance with privacy, the balance with misuse by, by researchers and, and trying to fit that in at least our US framework is, is a really difficult task. I guess maybe, let me start with like the question that, that was circulated for this panel, which is what does genuine data-driven platform oversight look like, which is where I started to put my head. And I think, um, and I apologize because I have a cat crying in the background because she's really missing being able to be in the room with me. So apologies if that's- I, I mean, I think I speak for everyone when we say let the cat in. <laughs> That'll distract me and then I'll lose my train of thought. Um, see, here's the thing, like, I think for that question of oversight, I think there are a bunch of embedded questions like oversight of what, which platforms, what harms, which, which public are we trying to serve? Who, which public interest is it? Because I don't think that we can guarantee it's universal. I think w one of the things that came to my mind with, with Nate's legislation is like, are the issues we're really looking at confined to US users, which is where the authority would vest? Or, or do we actually want to see things at a global scale? And how do we decide what the public interest is at a global scale, right? So I think there are questions I have about oversight and on what set of norms and laws do, do we rest that oversight? Um, I think that uh, then, then once you kind of answer those questions, you can get to questions like who conducts it, with what tools should be required. Um, and, and I think it's to what end. So, so I think one of the things to appreciate about the moment of, of why the research is so important is we're early in the regulatory process, notwithstanding the fact that we've been working with this for 25 years, we, we are early and what you see our policymakers struggling is like, they're not sure what they're regulating, right? Because it is different to regulate privacy versus human rights versus misinformation and the type of data and tools you want in order to do that research are different. So, so they don't know what to ask for we don't know how to standardize necessarily compliance with what. Privacy is the most advanced, I think, but I think content information is, is more difficult. Um, and so I think that the research part of it is actually just probing where do we get to the standardization? And your question about, well, we don't ask you know, accountants and car dealers to unearth all of their information. Part of it is because we have safety standards around cars we can compare a car that is fit and safe 
versus a car that is not. And, and we have groups that do that. And so we don't need to have this sort of research level in those, I think that they already happen. We need to get to that point. Um, and then just to like sort of incorporate like uh, the hungry, hungry hippo theory that Nabia had, I agree, right? And I think that just to put that in a framework, I think we want multiple layers of oversight, which means that the companies have to have multiple layers of, of making data accessible. I think there's a layer of access for the end user so that they understand the context of their experience and can manage it for themselves. And then I think there's a layer of access for journalists and consumer groups. So like, how does consumer reports do its job? It's because we can open up the hood of a car and take a look. And, and, and that's something that has to be evident. I think that companies need to have something that looks like that. And the question is like, what is the standardization of what they must show for those groups to be able to access? that might be the APIs like Twitter's academic API or, or something like that. And then I think what Nate gets to is like the hard stuff, right? The stuff that is sensitive so that we may not want it just freely floating out in the ether so that you know the Russians and the Chinese and everyone else can get to it, but we want verified credible researchers to be looking at hard things. And, and that happens in a much more restricted way. I think all three layers are necessary. And I think then the hard part is Again, going back to who are the platforms that we're focusing this on? What are the harms we're trying to address? Who is the public we're trying to protect? Those are really critical. Well, I, I kind of feel my anxiety level dropping as you kind of complete your introduction because you're like, look, I've sliced and diced it. Here's <laughs> a way of not making this a big pile of spaghetti. If we work on this, work on this, hungry, hungry hippos, all layers of things. This institute is sponsored by Mattel. Um, and uh, so all of that seems helpful as people are kind of feeling anxious, but not really knowing in what direction to go. Um, I'm intrigued by a, a quote um, uh, that you offered up on Twitter a while ago. Um, Tech companies need to be upfront about the problems they cause, wittingly or not. I'm frustrated by stale talking points about the promise of technology. Show the work. Cynical attempts to play at policy debate are a disservice to everyone in the field. Um, amazing use of 280 characters. Like that was a, a lot of ideas packed into a small uh, package. But um, I'm, I'm just thinking if you were to hit the trifecta, uh, having been at Google and Twitter, and now it's the perfect moment to join Facebook, um, just as the ship is sailing high. And uh, I'm Tell us what you would say. What's the first thing you'd say in the room of Facebook executives gathered about uh, having some free food and drinks and um, wanting your advice? What should they do next in this area? Or is it all the devil's in the details? Oh, inviting me to like really step into a hornet's nest. <laughs> <laughs> I am um, separating this out from Facebook what kind of like advice do I give to companies generally? Cause I do, I do some consulting for companies overall. Like it does no one any good to try to hide the ball, right? Like be honest. And, and, and when you can't say something, just say you can't say it and explain why, right? Like, because I don't want to invite a bunch of litigation because people- And, will... and do you think Facebook has been hiding the ball? I, I think that some of their blog posts are not, they, they, they seem, at least I read them as very cynical. As and is this not industry standard? Is this like, we would never do this at Twitter? Or... Honestly, I don't think it is. I think that there are some companies out there that are genuinely trying to be upfront and, and trying to balance what we have acknowledged, right? Like there is a user privacy issue. There are things that if I say, I don't actually know how it spins out, right? Like th there are answers they can't, they can't, there are questions they can't answer. There is data they don't have. There, there is a bunch of mess that they're worried about, right? And I think that that's fair. I think like we should, they should be able to say like, you know what, we didn't build our system for that. Um, and, and then get into the honest conversation of like, so what's the system we're supposed to be building? But, but pretending you got all the answers, pretending that like, we'll just add some more AI to that and it'll be fine. Like that does none of us any good. And that's the kind of stuff where I'm like, 
stop with the toxic positivity about where tech is going because it's not helping the public discussion. Um, that's what that was my frustration in that tweet. Got it. Um, my anxiety level is back up again. So thank you for uh, achieving uh, homeostasis. Yeah, more of a dinner yeah. party to get through. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, Ethan Zuckerman, uh, Professor of Public Policy, Communication and Information, Director of the Initiative for Digital Public Infrastructure at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, I think you're joining us from Western Massachusetts right now. Is that uh, correct? On, on a beautiful uh, chilly day in a beautiful chilly state office building on our uh, flagship campus here in beautiful Amherst. Well, uh, for one thing, let me just thank you for investing in a high quality microphone instead of using a tinny webcam like at least I am at the moment. It's uh, great to hear your voice in full dimension. Um, uh, here's uh, in a discussion with Elizabeth Hansen Shapiro um, uh, on a podcast, uh, you made reference to Social Science One, which Nate had invoked as an earlier kind of iteration of uh, perhaps an earnest attempt to work on this data sharing problem. And you said, one of the things that happened with this report uh, is that it's in the wake of a research project called Social Science One. It was this very ambitious research effort organized by a pair of just top social scientists to work with Facebook, open up a data set, study political influence elections instead of Facebook's role within it. Despite the fact that the academics who started the project had great contacts within Facebook, despite the fact that the People the data was opened up to were a set of accomplished academics had been very carefully screened. Um, uh, Facebook had a really hard time opening up the data. Many of the people involved with the project ended up just incredibly frustrated. A nicely um, a sort of mistakes were made, non-judgmental assertion of frustration by all. And I'm, I'm sure each party to that um, adventure would um, be able to describe some frustrations. I'd uh, welcome a chance to situate whatever you're thinking about now in terms of lessons learned from that effort, figuring that most of the people watching now or later won't have heard of it, yeah. and um, what you're thinking now as V2. Sure, so, so let me back up on this and say that um, at the end of all of this, what I'm going to be doing is saying yes and uh, to what Nate put on the table, but I'm actually gonna focus on something slightly different which is that I actually think there's an enormous amount of research that we can do without the cooperation of the platforms, if the platforms allow us to do that, or if we can get the legal or regulatory structure to allow us to do that. Which is so kind of what Nabiha was talking about around the citizen. I, use I'm government. very much on team Nabiha and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a story to get there. So okay. um, just as a bit of background on this, I've been building um, what's now politely referred to as an unauthorized data set uh, for about 14 years here. Uh, it is an independent index of news online. It's called Media Cloud. It's used by hundreds of researchers out there. And we started building it at the Berkman Klein Center not by asking permission, uh, but by essentially invoking the principle that Google used to index the web. This is a useful thing, and we're going to start assembling this and start doing this. And there are now other collections out there like PushShift, which is a very high quality index of the Reddit service that are sort of working along these ways. Um, what's basically happened in this space is that social scientists want to research these big powerful platforms because they appear to have such a huge influence on individuals and on our civic life in general. Projects like Social Science One have tried to hold hands with the platform, get access to the data. It's been incredibly time consuming. People have put thousands of hours into it. And at the end of the day, what Facebook actually released was bad data. Uh, they were missing more than half of it and they had mislabeled it so that people's work around it um, wasn't and able you're not to saying that it. was intentional it just it was no I, I, I yeah. what's amazing about it it doesn't matter if it's intentional uh, obviously it's worse if it's intentional but what's extraordinary about it is that the only way that we figured out that Facebook's data was inaccurate was that one of the researchers who had access to it was able to cross check it and say, this cannot possibly be a complete data set. And that led to the revelation that um, the social science one data set had excluded 
Americans who hadn't expressed a political preference on the left or on the right, essentially the, the middle of Americans. So we've tried to work with the platforms. You now have efforts around things like data donation, panel studies, things like the markup is doing with Citizen Browser, Mozilla is doing with Rally, and you've seen where that gets you. It gets the NYU Ad Observatory getting cease and desist from Facebook, essentially saying, no, 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 no. Um, you can't construct your own data set based on data donated by individual contributors. So we're now at the point where researchers, I, I think, need to start asserting and finding ways to defend rights. And specifically, we need to assert a right to publicly available data. Um, so let's consider YouTube, right? YouTube is surprisingly understudied, um, despite the fact that it's enormously influential. And it's because it's a pain in the ass to study. You actually have to grab the videos and transcribe them and do text analysis on them. It's very, very hard. And, and to what's do. an example of a question that seems like you'd love to see an answer to about YouTube that none of us knows the answer to? How much hate and extreme speeches on YouTube and how often is it recommended to the average user? Uh, you'd really love to test Kevin Roos's rabbit hole hypothesis. Uh, and the alternative to the rabbit hole hypothesis is there's racist content on YouTube and mostly racists find it. Um, the best effort we've had at finding this uh, comes out of Brendan Nyhan's lab up at Dartmouth, where he's tracked a thousand users and, and finds very little evidence uh, for the rabbit hole hypothesis. But I'd really like to do the work of trying to map extreme content across the site. We have a project under the Media Cloud banner where we're going to create a random sample of a million YouTube videos and work towards transcribing them uh, and try to create a searchable index out of this. And our Media argument- yeah, our argument for this is going to be that we are doing what Google has done for the web and we are simply doing it to YouTube. So first of all, you need the ability to sort of assert the right to study public data like that. The second is that there needs to be some sort of right of data donation or data altruism. What people are doing uh, with allowing users to put programs in their browser and say, I'm going to share my data, whether it's with NYU or the markup or somewhere else, that needs to be protected. We see under some of the data regulation coming out of the EU, this notion of data altruism. You should have the right to share your data with researchers in those contexts. So in addition to what Nate is doing, which I'm completely, completely supportive of, I want to see legislation around uh, a safe harbor for researchers. And I want to get around the problem that you are absolutely right in putting on the table, Jonathan, around Clearview by essentially saying you don't want to solve this in terms of saying this is technically possible or this is technically impossible. If you make Clearview AI technically impossible, you break a whole lot of other things, including the ability to do research on public accessible data. What you have to do instead is something that the law is actually pretty good at, which is distinguishing intent. There is a big difference between me scraping thousands of YouTube videos to try to find extreme speech and me generating a database of faces so that I can sell it to law enforcement. And one of the great things about law is that we can distinguish why it is being done and how it is being used. And that's one of the critical distinctions we need to make here. The tech platforms tend to insist, if this is possible, this will be abused. But the notion of research for the public good, for public purposes, is an idea that we really have an obligation to formalize them to support here. And I, I can't tell, at first I thought, as you were winding up, you were saying that this shouldn't be left to the cat and mouse game of whose grappling hook goes over which wall or how tall the wall it like the public policy should sort of just say what the balance should be between those who want the data and for what purposes and those who have the data. But given the focus on carving out exceptions for altruistic data sharing by citizens 
so that the markup and others can do the kinds of really eye-opening studies that they do for which the platforms and often say, but that's incomplete because we have the rest of the data and here's where you got something wrong. Um, I guess, is it just all of the above? There ought to be an opportunity to do that kind of uh, ad hoc sampling and that should not be legally penalized, but at the same time, uh, there should be a FOIA-like pallet of data shared through the auspices of something like Nate's proposal. So uh, Nate's proposal is critically important for certain types of decisions where you're just never going to release all the data. Let's take content moderation, right? An open topic and content moderation is whether some groups are moderated more aggressively than others. Let's get political and say that you're much more likely to have content pulled down if you're Palestinian than if you're Israeli, right? I've that's certainly seen that claim, yes. That's, that's often made. That's very hard to evaluate with public data um, because you can't just look at the content that remains on the site you actually have to look at the content that's pulled down. So you that's data. What isn't there. So, right. So that that's data where you need a method like Nathan's. You could also do this with some sort of audit method, where you have some sort of an organization that is going to come in, look at the data, run some tests against the algorithms, and say you, Facebook, are complying with generally accepted algorithmic fairness principles in the same way that a financial audit says that you're complying with generally accepted auditing principles. There's not actually a huge amount of difference between the two. You're basically talking about creating a firm to do some of the testing uh, that Nate would be doing. I'm really talking about something different. I'm talking about the stuff that is out there in the public. You can, in theory, go to Reddit and create an index of all the public content in there. And that's what Jason Baumgartner has done for Push Shift. You can, if you are a glutton for punishment, um, go through the different YouTube IDs and find valid YouTube videos and create an index out of them. This we demon are, dialing we, YouTube uh, video. We, are, we are doing a slightly less stupid version of that. But yes, we're, we're doing uh, some variant of that to get a true random sample of YouTube uh -huh. so that we can actually say things like, what languages is YouTube in? Uh -huh. There's alarmingly little basic research on this platform, which for my child and for yours is essentially going to be their exposure to the media universe. And it's not, in this case, because it's legally constrained, it's that um, the tools are really, really hard to build and that we actually as a field need to invest in building them and making them accessible to researchers across the board. So back over to Nicole for a second, uh, with of course it being understood that you couldn't possibly offer legal advice publicly through a Zoom video because that wouldn't be a good idea. I'm curious for your academic ruminations as a skilled lawyer in this area, um, about both the level of genuine risk that Nabia and Ethan are talking about as they're trying to organize this sort of um, adversarial, I think was the delicate word used, data collection, um, is receiving a nasty letter from Facebook just a rite of passage and you know we put it on the wall and we're done, or is it potentially represent a real problem? And secondly, you alluded to the need for standards and coordination, uh, maybe not just so there'd be apples to apples data collection across platforms and circumstances, but because there's a lot of jurisdictions here. And I'm curious how much, even if a company's wanting to somehow come to an accommodation, whether under pressure or on its own sense of what it should do, you're looking at the EU and saying, my God, if I share so much as the Pantone color of somebody's screen, I'm, I'm running afoul of the EU privacy directive. And does it, is this the kind of thing that for, you know, ideas like Nate's, we've got to do some kind of global coordination or can we just, US does one thing and the rest of the world adapts? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna travel one road because I think actually Nabia and Ethan will speak better on, on, on the issue of scraping than I will. But it, like the one part where I'm really interested and I don't have a good solution yet is the data donation idea, which I support and I also think is fraught. Like, and, and I, but I believe that there's a way to do it. So, so I think about data donation, like 
um, in the medical context, right? Patients donate their data all the time and we have a system for doing that and doing it safely so that research can be done and advances can be made. So like, I believe that this is possible. I also think in, in the social media context, because when I donate my data, it might not just be my data, right? It's all the other people who are in my network's data too sometimes, or the people who are shown in my video. Because if you've got a plugin in your browser that Nabia made yes. that uh, shows her researchers everything you see, if we're friends, you'll right. see the full account that the public doesn't see and then send it over. Or if I port my Twitter feed, right? Uh -huh. for, for whatever purpose to, to the ad observatory. Like I, there, there are other stakeholders involved in that. And I guess I'm wondering how um, researchers, journalists are thinking about that problem because it does feel to me like a potentially real problem in the hands of the wrong, wrong researchers. I mean, one of the comforts I take, and I know that, you know, like it, Nate's solution is, is a very like cabin to very strictly like vetted researchers. But that also, from my perspective, feels a lot safer, right? Like that, that there will be um, both appropriate scope of research and accountability for the breach of, of trust with, with the subjects that you have. Um, and I don't, know how to, I don't know how to balance those out, but it, they, they do trouble me a lot with this process. Got it. Um, OK, so now Nicole is anxious. I'm wondering if either of Navia or Ethan can Put that to rest. And I think my lights just went out, but everything else is going fine. So um, I think one of the things that is critically important to make data donation work well is to have careful privacy review. Um, so for instance, when the NYU Ad Observatory started building their plugin, they had Mozilla come in and do a thorough privacy review and came out with some suggestions and otherwise a clean bill of health. Um, we, I think, um, perhaps as, as, as a, a group have, have some healthy skepticism of whether IRB is entirely up to, um, being able to do this work, both because some of the most interesting work is being done by activists and journalists, uh, but also because these are really technical issues that may require literal code review at some points fairly soon we probably need a body of researchers who are doing privacy reviews, who are doing code reviews on code before we're throwing it in the browser. Uh, because so you're saying you need it. oversight for the oversight. No, I'm because saying- the, the browser plugin is doing the oversight of Facebook and now you're saying about oversight of what you're doing. I'm suggesting that researchers might actually successfully regulate ourselves. Um, that if we actually built a, a professional industry body and uh, did the work of reviewing each other's code and reviewing each other's research strategies, um, I think that's probably more believable uh, than believing that Facebook is going to release all the data that we need to see about the internal research. So I think it's critically important, Nicole, but I, I don't think it's a game stopper uh, in the ways that it otherwise might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to. I want to jump in to say that I, I do. I do think it's a hard question, and it's a hard question that we've grappled with in the law. Although I don't have the optimism of legal real brilliance that uh, Ethan service uh, surface. <laughs> like you know, um, we faced a version of this question before on a different scale when we were confronting the digitization of court records. Right when court records went from being things cloistered away in a courthouse to now being available on Pacer, to pay five cents for a page, and all of a sudden get access to every single exhibit, um, to for everything for all of these lawsuits that would have a variety of information that yes perhaps is relative to the to the parties at hand but now available to everybody right so sort of picking up on the structure of the question that Nicole presented of like people who have nothing to do with this right, with a dispute at hand or the research at hand, all of a sudden having their information available. And there, you know, there's a regime of redaction and your responsibilities and structures and standards. But what that surfaces is that you don't necessarily need gatekeepers, but you need some form of gatekeeping. And the gatekeeping can be agreed upon standards, right, that like Ethan references that in order to play in the sandbox, you got to agree to the rules of the playground. Um, it could be 
and I think lots of people um, retreat to this saying some institutions are uh, appointed with the gatekeeper authority and academic institutions could feel more trustworthy than journalists, although you know, lots of people can cosplay as researchers or academics and, and cause all kinds of trouble. But I do think it's worth thinking about what that gatekeeping um, function should look like that is both maximally inclusive, but gives us some escape hatch to say, yeah, you know what, your methods are for commercial competitive reasons, right? You're actually scraping all of this information to build a business like Clearview AI. That's not in service of the public, you can't play. Um, or you, we don't think that you actually have the capability of safeguarding this data in a way, just technically, we don't think you have the capability, so you can't play. We're going to have to create those rules, but and I think we have to accept there's going to be some gatekeeping function that plays in there. Very briefly. And, and who's the best gatekeeper, do you think? What would that look like institutionally? Oh, you can't ask a First Amendment person about gatekeepers. Ugh, I hate that. Uh, you just said it has to happen. Gate, gatekeeping. Someone has to gatekeep. So I actually <laughs> think the focus, the focus on standards is the one that feels the most comfortable to me, right? Um, that is really looking at, can you certify in a credible way that you are following the, a set of procedures that are agreed upon. I think where it gets really hard, and this is where I want to raise your anxiety level again, but agree with Nicole, is that like, who do you trust to do that? Is it a government agency? Is it self-certification? Is it an independent body like the bar for lawyers or whatever the equivalent is for other fiduciaries um, who hold information? I mean, I think this is like that, this is what makes it hard, but I think there are options. I think that a really interesting question that I struggle with, right, is when I look at the body of media law, like a lot of a lot of standards are made because of mistakes, right? Like something goes sideways and it's like, yeah, maybe we don't want to do undercover journalism or like or some mistake prompts a correction. And in this universe, what do mistakes look like and what's the level of mistake that we're comfortable with as we stumble towards the right balance in, in this moment? I think that's a, I, I that keeps me up at night. Got it. Well, maybe this is a good opportunity to put it back to Nate, because here you've offered up potentially something writable in the stone of law that would mandate forms of data sharing is it do, do you anticipate any form of gatekeeping or vetting for what your law would provide that the companies have to share um vetting of the consumers of that data or it's kind of on a public page uh knowing that there have been rare instances i think in which foia answers have been titrated so that they don't just get uh released to the public like there's a reading room and you have to physically present yourself at the reading room to read it and you can't have a camera with you that kind of thing so there are a few answers there uh first so there's the scraping provision of this proposed bill and then there's the the um secure data access provision right most of what i'm focusing on is the secure data access provision which does have a whole system of vetted researchers modeled on the nsf uh sort of procedures that one would use for um, uh, grants and the like and research projects. The other analogy is, is the sworn, um, what is it called? Like the sworn researcher access to uh, census data. And so there are these analogies that are out there um, for this, but, but, but you know, remember what I'm trying to prevent is another Cambridge Analytica, <laughs> right? We, we, we've been talking about this as if, the, as if the people who want access to these data are, are all in the sort of public spirit here or that it's easy to distinguish between good and bad uh, people when it comes to access to the data. And so um, um, my view is, so, so but, but I, I support everything that, that's been said so far. I would like to have de many different tiers and strategies for access by researchers as what, however we define them and journalists, right? I just can't figure out how to define some of those other categories. I also, it is, it is quite challenging and, and I would even be self-critical of the bill on this when, when it comes to scraping it's not so easy to define what is public and what is private. And people need to sort of understand that. Um, and if you, if you just declare that everything on Facebook is public or something like this, then there are ways that they can, as you went through password protection or whatever else, to start sort of changing the nature of the platform in order to prevent it from um, uh, being uh, completely scraped. And so, uh, you know, the way I anticipate this is that there is a vetted procedure for the secure access um, that there's much lighter touch when it comes to uh, scraping, but it is still, uh, my proposal is still limited to university researchers. That doesn't mean it shouldn't. I would love to see it expanded. And uh, Ethan and I have been on some uh, 
other calls where, where there's some other proposals out there. Um, uh, I do think it is very hard actually to, to make the trigger be the intent of the researcher because the, um, the platforms don't know what the intent is, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, and, and so if they're going to be in a position of, of enforcement um, where they might actually even be liable for the kinds of data that might be scraped by someone on the outside, they can't be in the middle of, of policing this. They're, they're going to be um, uh, overly restrictive. So- And I guess, uh, yeah. I, I was gonna say, I guess Cambridge Analytica was an example of a cat's paw that you had an academic fronting for yeah, uh, exactly. a group. I know we're just about a time and you especially now you have to dash. Let me just ask a, a final question, which is, I feel like so far our conversation is presuming that if we can get the data flows going in the all of the above kinds of ways, we'll have a chance to start knowing better what's going on on the platforms, how it's affecting people, and then start forming public policy interventions where they might be reasonably called for. That's kind of the background shared assumption here. And I just want to test that out as a foreground assumption, which is, is it still then the kind of idea that everything not prohibited should be permitted until we detect a problem through good data collecting analysis and cogitation? Or is, are there areas where it should be everything is prohibited until it's permitted? I mean, I, I guess I'm just trying to ask like the fundamental Silicon Valley thing is innovation, move fast, break things. And is this move fast, break things, but then fix them? Or is it not that? Well, I, look, that, that's, a, that's the most meta of meta questions there. I mean, that, 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 that means, <laughs> I, no, no but, but part of it is, is like, if you're talking about like the, 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 the design of technology, right? Then of course there should be rules as to, you know, prohibitions at the front end as well as at the back end, right? Um, and I don't so, know. That's that's what I'm wondering. No, look. I mean, this is we deal with this in in you know cloning or CRISPR or you know all kinds of ethical uh, uh, challenges, and so we want to uh, you know change differences. You, you know, have uh, ethical restrictions at the front end as well. The, the the point about transparency legislation like this is that it will both have a chilling effect on bad practices at the company because they will it will be harder for them to keep it secret. And it will inform public policy. So if we want to deal with these content moderation or other issues, then we can do so in an intelligent way. Got it. Any other thoughts on that uh, question among Ethan, Nicole, or Nadia? I, I just want to flip the script a little bit. Um, the Silicon Valley approach to this is basically said, let's try all the maximally profitable ways of organizing people online. Right. At the end of the day, the innovation has been around uh, how much attention can we capture and monetize and how much data can we pull from you in the process. It would be really helpful if we were innovating with some other criteria in mind. Um, one useful set of criteria would be, do these tools make us better democratic citizens? Do they make us better neighbors? Do we take care uh, of people online in better ways? Those aren't things that are well valued by markets. Those are things that are sometimes valued by states. So for me, I'm really interested in these questions of how we get more data out of these platforms. But I also feel like we're sort of nipping around the edges. The real conversation we should be having is what do we actually want social media to be? And then how do we build the structures to get to that new form of social media? For me, that's a much more interesting question then these questions, which largely come down to fixing the problems of trillion dollar corporations. And frankly, everyone on this call is underpaid uh, in sort of doing that work. We should actually be doing the work of imagining and building uh, better systems that are better for us as members of society. So instead of asking, what should the regulatory framework and how preemptive should it be for profit maximizing companies looking to invest big in this area and make lots of money, you're saying maybe it should be an entirely different framework to begin with. By all means, regulate, by all means, increase transparency. But some non-zero portion of our effort needs to be around this question of what would good digital public spaces look like? And if we were willing to get really creative and use public money, charitable money, all sorts of different ways to do it, how would we design and build those spaces? Great question. Nate, we know you have to bounce. Um, thank you, thank you. Nicole and Nabia, let's just, uh, last words uh, on this front, delighted to hear them for the ages. 
I, I just want to plus one what Ethan has to say. You know, we're in a moment where Web3 is rising. We have to understand how we got here in order to build something better with granularity. And regulations can change the incentive landscape as it should, perhaps. Um, but I think I'm really interested in making sure that we do not repeat the mistakes that we have made in the last 25 years as we build a whole new infrastructure. So the time is now for all of this. Very good. Nicole, you got the last word. Or your cat I, have, does. I have no last words. I had a cat. That was, that was my last word. No, I, I, this was such a great conversation. I, I do think we're like at the start, right? And so I, th I think recognition for all of us, but also in our communication with the public that we are at the start and the start is essential um, in terms of like what we make open and what we research. But I also agree the, the, the importance of Ethan's work in sort of having a digital public infrastructure or some alternative to the world we live in now is we have to have a positive statement of what we're going to be, not just continually playing defense with what we have. On that uh, terrific note, thanks so much. I hope we can convene again uh, in some interval and see what progress we have made uh, or not. I somehow at this moment at least feel less anxious. Um, so thank you all for uh, this discussion and for um, lending uh, a start to uh, our uh, modest effort, uh, joining so many others, including those by uh, the folks here. And another thank you to um, Hillary Ross, uh, Will Marks, and Madeline Matsui for uh, organizing and uh, prepping for this panel today. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you.